According to many people, Guillermo Marconi invented the wireless telegraph. In fact, his name was so connected to wireless telegraphs that for many years, telegraphs were called Marconigrams. However, he wasn't the first to make a wireless transmission, nor did he invent most of the devices used in his experiments. How did this basically uneducated man make a wireless telegraph empire, win the Nobel Prize, and destroy Nikola Tesla's life? Well, I'll tell you in the video. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. In the summer of 1894, an Italian Irish man named Guillermo Marconi read an obituary of Heinrich Hertz and was inspired to make wireless telegraph go around the world. Marconi was oddly uneducated. I say odd because he came from a very wealthy family. His father was from Italian nobility, and his mother was an heiress of the whiskey fortune from Jameson and Sons. However, Marconi's Protestant mother didn't want him to, quote, come into contact with the great superstition that is commonly taught to small children in Italy. Therefore, Marconi was educated by a string of tutors that gave him a sporadic education that, with his mother's permission, skipped anything that young Marconi didn't like, including most math and physics. The obituary of Hertz mentioned Hertz's greatest accomplishment. He had discovered invisible electromagnetic waves that moved and acted just like light waves. In other words, Hertz had discovered radio wave. Hertz had created his wave with an antenna attached to an induction coil and received it by looking at a teeny tiny spark in a ring receiver. If Marconi was gonna use Hertzian waves to send long distance wireless telegraphs, the first thing he needed was a better receiver. And luckily for him, an Englishman named Oliver Lodge had found one. Lodge had met Hertz and was profoundly sad to hear of his passing. To honor him, Lodge decided to give a talk on the work of Hertz. However, to make a more dramatic demonstration, he needed a better way to show that radio waves travel long distances. For that reason, Lodge decided to use a tube with metal filings in his receiver. Four years earlier, a French physicist had shown that these little metal filings will stick together or cohere when they're in the presence of a radio wave and will therefore have much lower resistance. This is why Lodge called this item a coherer. Lodge had the bright idea of setting up a separate circuit in his receiver with an antenna, a battery, a coherer, and a current meter that turned a mirror so that it was visible to all when the current changed. When he created a radio wave on one side of the room, the metal and the coherer stuck together and became conductive, so the current meter turned. In other words, Lodge made the first known radio wave that was easily detected. Lord Rayleigh told Lodge, quote, there is your life's work. But instead, Lodge went on vacation and then got distracted with other work and mysticism. Marconi, however, was not distracted. In fact, he was possessed. Once he read of Lodge's experiment, he spent thousands of hours improving on the coherer through trial and error. Marconi ended up creating a coherer that was a small tube with only a tiny V-shaped area for the metal shavings in a partial vacuum. Marconi also found that a tall antenna worked better than a short one, and an antenna that was grounded, stuck into the ground at the top of a hill, worked even better. These inventions were important, but Marconi's biggest input had to do with his complete lack of understanding of basic physics. See, no one at the time thought radio waves could travel that far because they move in a straight line and the Earth is curved. It's like having a really bright light on a lighthouse. After a certain distance, you can't see it no matter how bright it is. Marconi didn't have a good answer for this. He was just really, really convinced it would work out somehow. Still, he needed a way to make a very powerful radio wave. And luckily for him, Nikola Tesla had already figured that out. Back in the summer of 1889, five years before Hertz's death, Nikola Tesla had heard about the miracle of Hertz's wave at the World's Fair in Paris. Inspired, he adjusted the transmitter by using an AC source instead of a DC battery and an interrupter and moving the position of the capacitor or the condenser and making it variable. This oscillating transformer made extremely high voltage 
alternating current, and Tesla patented it in April of 1891. What he invented was quickly called a Tesla coil, and it was a sensation. However, Tesla wasn't much interested in long distance telegraph. He had loftier idea. Long distance wireless lighting, and then electrifying the atmosphere, and even making the whole earth quiver with electricity. All of this, by the way, is complete nonsense, but they had no way of knowing this at the time. In fact, in March of 1901, JP Morgan gave Tesla $150,000 for a giant whole earth transmission tower. Meanwhile, Marconi was trying to build his receiving and transmission tower. In 1900, Marconi tried to patent his transmitter, but was rejected by the patent office as being too similar to Tesla's previous ones. Undeterred, Marconi left the details to the lawyers and built giant radio receivers and transmitters in Cape Cod, Massachusetts and in Cornwall, England. The machine in Cape Cod was so loud that it was affectionately known as the Thunder Factory. On December 12, 1901, Marconi said that he heard an SOS in Cape Cod from England over 2,200 miles away. I use the phrase said that he heard because there was much doubt at the time whether he actually heard it. And now we are totally convinced that he did not hear that signal. Radio waves at that frequency do not travel that far during the day. Because of the skeptics, two months later, Marconi listened to signals from Cornwall on a ship as it sailed away with people to verify it and got a message as far as 2,000 miles away, but only at night. During the day, he could only get signals at 700 miles. Marconi called this the daylight effect. His daughter wrote that he yelled, damn the sun, how long will it torture us? But why do radio waves travel farther than if they were just going in straight lines? And why did that not occur during the day? Marconi had the odd theory that the wave skimmed along the surface of the earth due to the fact that he grounded his antenna and the sunlight acted like a fog. And Tesla thought it was going through the earth just like he predicted with no reason at all for the sunlight to have any effect. Later that year, Oliver Heaviside, a man with an awful hairdo who condensed Maxwell's equations from 20 to four, solved the riddle. He thought that part of the atmosphere reflects the radio waves so that it could bounce along the surface and the ground. He also thought this layer had more complexity during the day, so that the waves would often bend instead of bounce. Irrespective of why, Marconi proved that radio waves could travel long distances. He was proud to say that, quote, there is no longer any question about the ability of wireless telegraphy to transmit messages across the Atlantic. When Tesla heard of Marconi's accomplishments, he was unconcerned saying, Marconi is a good fellow, let him continue. He's using 17 of my patents. However, that good feeling was destroyed in 1904 when the patent office reversed its rulings and gave the patent to Marconi. At the same time, JP Morgan was getting pretty frustrated with Tesla and the money pit of the tower. Marconi's method was cheaper and was proven to work. Morgan stopped funding Tesla and Tesla had to give up the project. The tower was destroyed and he had a nervous breakdown. He died penniless 39 years later. A few months after Tesla's death, the US Supreme Court recognized Tesla and Lodge and others for their initial contributions to wireless telegraphs. Back to Marconi. Despite the fact that he didn't know how or why his telegraphs work, he still got them to work. Soon, many ships had Marconi machines to send Marconi grants. In a feat of pure propaganda, Marconi co-won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1909. Marconi moved back to Italy, joined the Italian fascist party, and became close friends with Mussolini. On July 19, 1937, Marconi had a heart attack and politely told his valet, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to put you and my friends to considerable trouble. I fear my end is near. Will you please inform my wife? Marconi died 45 minutes later. At his funeral, wireless and radio operators held two minutes of silence in his honor. That was the last time there were no man-made radio signals whizzing through the air. Of course, in 1937, a large portion of the radio signals were not sending Morse code. Instead, they were broadcasting music and news. How did we change from wireless Morse code to music? I'll explain the physics of the first radio broadcast next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity.
Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a nice thumbs up and check out all my other videos. Okay, have a nice day.